Well, welcome back everybody. It is an absolutely stellar day here in Niagara Falls, Ontario. But being mid-October, it is starting to get a little bit cool out. It's only about 10 degrees Celsius out there. Now for me, that means one thing. Snowmobiling season is fast approaching and I'm getting really excited. But before I can start working on my snowmobile, I have to finish up this Baja 50 project that we started in the previous video. Now, today we're going to take a look at the carburetor, we're going to have a look at the clutch and the oil filter, and give the bike a general overall cleaning. Once we're done that, the next video will really be about fixing up the damaged plastics. So, why don't you sit back and grab something warm to drink on a cool day like this, and enjoy Dino's Tinker Shed. I'm going to finish my coffee before I start today. After I finished taking the bike apart in the last video, I took a bit of a stock in terms of what parts I think I'm going to need for the bike, and overall I don't think it's a lot. I knew I wanted to take the clutch cover off, and to do that I should probably have a gasket ready if the old one didn't come off cleanly. So I went to Amazon and found an entire gasket set for $14.99. Now, anybody who's bought gaskets from other companies will know that gasket sets are very expensive. They could be $80 or even $100 for a typical single-cylinder motorcycle like this. So at $14.99, I was quite pleased. And while I was there, I found a new Petcock as well for $12. So for under $30, I think I have all of the parts that I need to keep the project rolling, which is great. And this really does highlight the value of this style of motorcycle and this project in general. It's something that you can take on and even with a modest budget can get this bike running really well. And it's something you can either do yourself or even better, get your kids involved in it. It's a lot of fun. Well, I think the first thing we should focus on is the carburetor. Let's get that pulled apart, cleaned up and see what it looks like. It was quite clean on the outside. I'm curious to see what it looks like on the inside. Okay, let's get going. The best thing about these little motorcycles is how simple things are. These carburetors are really a basic, basic carburetor. I'm just going to uh, show you here how the, uh, the actual choke works. It's basically just a gate valve on these. To get the float bowl off, we do have to take off these two screws on the bottom. And I'm going to use a JIS screwdriver here. One of my subscribers recommended that I use these. And I have to say they are superior to a Phillips. In a pinch, you can use a good quality Phillips screwdriver, but if you do this kind of work on a routine basis, well, you know what? These are, I think, a good investment, and uh, I certainly would endorse them. So I'm gonna pop off the float bowl here and take a look at how much crap is in the bottom. I do believe this is what kills a lot of these motorcycles, is people buy them, they use them for the first season, they work really good, and then they park them, and they get all contaminated with all this varnish, and they never run right again. So I'm going to take off all of the small componentry here, things like the main jet which comes out. And this is an interesting jet. It actually has an emulsion tube built right onto the main jet. It's kind of interesting. Then I'm going to take out the pilot jet, which is the smaller jet next to the main jet. I use a very sharp flat bladed screwdriver and take this out. Now it's a much smaller jet and it's responsible for your low speed throttle performance. I had a bit of trouble getting the floats off here. The pin was pretty tight. I couldn't push it out with this pick. So I enlisted the help of my wife. Basically I just lined the pin up over a socket. I then placed the pick over the, the actual pin and she tapped it out for me here. And it worked pretty good. You gotta know when to ask for help. Awesome, thank you. Okay. And now that the pin's out, we can pull the float itself out. 
Attached to the floats are your float needle valve. So this basically plugs the flow of fuel when the float bowl's full and stops the carburetor from overfilling. Now you can kind of see overall the carb is pretty dirty inside and it really does need a good cleaning. I'm going to continue to pull out all the rest of the parts. This is your idle screw and here is your fuel air mixture screw. Now depending on what side of the carburetor on is on it either controls fuel flow or it controls air flow. I believe this controls fuel flow because it's on the actual air box side but I'm not 100% sure. And I'm going to gingerly pull out the o-ring on the bowl itself. I basically just want to take this off before I put it through the cleaning process. Just be careful when you do this. Now these aren't expensive to replace but I don't have one with me so I really want to keep this in good shape. And now I'm going to put everything right into the ultrasonic cleaner basket. I'm going to jam the, uh, the float itself underneath the ba little basket here just to keep it submerged during the cleaning process. And then I'll put all of the smaller components like the jets and the needle valve and that into this little basket so they don't get lost. These ultrasonic cleaners are really handy if you're using using a lot of uh, small carburetors or cleaning a lot of small carburetors and things like that. These work really well. I put it in for about half an hour. It gives me time to think about other things. What can I think about? Hmm, I wonder. I can't wait for winter. I just love snowmobiling. All right, looks like we're done. So once I get these out of the basket, I'll take these down and downstairs into my basement and rinse them thoroughly with warm water to get all the uh, cleaning agent off of them. And once that's done, I'll bring them over to the bench. I'll use a little bit of compressed air just to dry all the components out to make sure there's no water sitting in any of the galleries. Next, I'm going to start assembling the carburetor. So I'm going to actually put on the air intake first. It's easier to do this on the bench, I find, than to do it on a bike. So I'm just going to put these on and I'm going to snug them down by hand. You can really see that that ultrasonic cleaned everything up really, really well. I'm, I'm quite pleased with the performance of that piece of equipment. Now to put the float itself back in. Basically, I just hook the needle valve on there and gently slide it back down into the assembly here. And then that pin slides in and I'm going to use a set of pliers just to sort of squeeze it all the way into the hole. There's some retaining flutes on the little clip itself or the little shaft itself that hold it inside the carburetor body and it seems to work really well. And I'll just go along and replace all of the other parts and components similar to what we did before. This is just the drain plug bolt again. Now these little jets cleaned up really, really well. I'm quite pleased with them. And you can see just how nice and shiny they are, but I still want to make sure that all the small passages are clean. And to do that, I'm going to use a set of welding tip cleaners. These are just very fine wires that are designed to clean out orifices similar to a carburetor. I take the thinnest one I have and I pass it through all of the small holes and galleries on each one of the jets. Now 
you do not want to enlarge the holes. You just want to knock loose anything that might be built up in the holes. And that's what I do here. After that, it's just a matter of reassembly till you get to the point we have here. Um, and the carburetor's really ready to go again. If you remember in our last episode, we actually drained the oil out of the engine. So I'm just going to thread and tighten up the drain bolt here so I don't lose it. Next, we have to remove all of these bolts around the clutch cover. The clutch is housed right underneath this bulge here. But first, we have to take off the Kickstarter. Now, to do this, you pull the one bolt completely out and then wiggle the Kickstarter off the splines on the shaft itself. Now the reason you take the entire bolt out is there's a milled groove in the shaft that the bolt passes through. This is a bit of a safety feature on these Kickstarters so it can't come off if it's loose. Now if you've seen any of my other videos, you may have noticed one of these. And what this is, is this is a bolt template, okay? So it matches the bolt pattern around this case cover here. I've never had this off. I don't know if these bolts are all different lengths. This helps you register those bolts as you take them out, and that way you will never get them mixed up putting them back in. All right, I'm gonna start taking these bolts out. First thing I'm going to do here is just break all of the bolts free around the perimeter of the cover. This is a good practice. You can do it just with the impact driver, but I just like to do this by hand. It's a bit of a throwback for me. Next I'm going to put the oil pan back under to catch any oil that might come out once the seal itself is broken. And I'm going to run the rest of the bolts out with the impact now that they're loose and I'll place them into our template here so I don't lose track of where the bolts go. Now once this is done, I'm gonna follow this up with a soft face dead blow hammer to break the gasket free. Just be careful, this, this aluminum can crack. Just take your time and try to wiggle it out. It, it seems a little bit stuck here and I realize that the case is actually touching the frame. It's such a tight fit. So I have to take this one bolt out. There's only two bolts that hold this engine in. And then I'll pull straight up on the cylinder head to gain some access here. But to get that bolt out, I actually have to take off the side cover that covers the sprocket and the flywheel itself here first. Here you can see the sprocket and the flywheel. And I'll just chase this bolt out and then I'll pull straight up on the cylinder head which I don't have a picture of here. Um, I do finally get the case off. This is a new camera and <laughs> I lost the footage. It's crazy. Now that we have the cover off you can see the clutch here. It's that round disc on the right side there that I'm touching. The first thing we're going to do is take off this ramp here that basically actuates the clutch when you do shift gears and there's a small spring and a small sleeve here that has to come off first. Don't lose these but this just lifts off. What we really want to get to here is this cover plate which hold on with these four screws. Now I knock those out with an impact driver 
and that allows me to get the cover plate off and this is actually your oil filter on these little bikes you can see all the goo that builds up in here that's centrifugal action that blows all the chips out and holds them inside the clutch and you can see just how much crap gets covered in here you can see it on the end of my fingers a lot of silver shinies now I'm just going to clean this up with a little bit of brake cleaner. I don't need to get this super, super clean. It's going to get filthy again anyway, but I do try to get as much of the contaminants out of here as possible. Now, this cover plate can be a little hard to get off to gain access. Some people will use a hammer-driven impact driver to get these off, but I find a really good bit in your impact electric impact driver will get that off easily enough. And you also have the opportunity to clean out this oil screen that's down near the drain plug. And take a look how clean the engine is. I was actually surprised, uh, given how dirty the oil was, that how clean the engine really was inside. I didn't clean in there. That's just the way it is. It looks pretty good, actually. So I'll just slide the screen back in, and that's ready for the next phase. Now that I've got it clean, I'm going to put the cover back on. Sometimes the gasket that's on there gets damaged, and you may need a new one. I didn't in this uh, case. It was good enough. I'm going to run these up to the face with this JIS screwdriver just to make sure not to damage the, the um, heads of these bolts here. And because you can't really tighten these up without the engine turning, I use the impact driver and just gently give it a single tap or two with it just to snug these down. It seemed to work pretty well. I don't know if this is the right method or not, but it worked for me. And that's just basically reassembly. I'm going to put the shift ramp back on here. I'm going to put this little spring and the collar back in. And then I'm going to line up the shift fork down here with the, with the uh, shift ramp itself. And we're, we're good to go. I'm going to shift gears here and adjust the valves, which are located underneath these two threaded plugs. I'm going to use a wrench and just pop these free. They just thread in. And there is a O-ring on both the top and bottom here. That you don't want to lose. Now once you get these out you're going to see the valve assembly itself and what we're going to be looking for is the gap between the bottom of the rocker arm and the top of the valve stem. Now on these small Honda bikes they're around two to three thousandths but before we can do that we have to find top dead center so on the engine case there is a mark here that I've highlighted with this sharpie and on the flywheel there's a couple marks there's one F and the one we're interested in is T, meaning top dead center, but this doesn't necessarily mean it's at top dead center. We actually have to cycle the valve train. So I'm going to turn the flywheel in a counterclockwise rotation, and once we see that the valves open like this and close like that, now we're going to line up the line to the T, and that means we're at top dead center. So I'm going to use a feeler gauge here and stick it between the bottom of the tappet and the top of the valve stem. And you can see I can't get the feeler gauge in between. it. It's just too tight. They're actually touching here. So what I need to do is actually break free this jam nut so that I can adjust the tappet screw here. They're pretty tight, but eventually I get it. Now I have a small little tool that I can stick on the top here that I've made. It's basically a number two Robertson screw. I can back out the tappet, fit my feeler gauge in between the bottom of the tappet screw and the top of the valve, and then I just gently tighten that down until it's snug. I lightly snug up the jam nut, and then I come back in holding the actual bolt. I snug down the nut even more. Now the goal here is that we don't increase, or sorry, decrease the gap. So I'm going to come back in and check it. And we're really good here still. This just slides in. It's really, really good. So then I'm just going to follow this up by really tightening down the jam nut here. So I'm just going to hold the tappet screw and mm, snug that up. And we're good to go. And then the bottom, of course, is exactly the same. This, of course, was in spec, so I didn't need to touch anything. It's great. Now I'm just going to thread the caps back on, snug them up. There's an O-ring there so you don't need to go like Hercules on this. Just snug them down so they don't leak oil. Uh. 
Now that the valves are done, let's put on the cover here for the clutch. So the first thing we do is make sure that we have the right gasket. And it looks like we do. It lines up pretty well. So we need to just remove this old gasket here. There's different ways to do it. This one comes off relatively easy. I'm going to start by using some brake cleaner on a rag and just sort of spray a little on the rag and try to get it off. And it gets most of the material off. But I follow this up with a very mild Rotolock scotch brake disc. And this just conditions the surface. It doesn't really take any material off. Don't use sandpaper on this. You can use a plastic razor blade. There's a bunch of different options, but I prefer this conditioning disc. It just gets all the old material off. And then I'm going to dry fit it just to absolutely make sure I have the right gasket. And I do. This is really cut well. Remember, $14 for the whole set. Now I like to glue mine on and I'm using a little bit of gasket maker but I only ever glue one side. I always glue the gasket to the cover side and I use a paintbrush and just paint a small amount of gasket sealant on the outside. This really acts as glue and helps to ensure that when I take the cover off again the gasket can be reused because it'll be fastened to the cover plate. Here we go. There's a nice coating there. And then I just Gently set the gasket on using the dowel pin as an alignment tool and let that tack up a little bit, maybe 10 or 15 minutes, just so that it sits nice and the gasket doesn't float around. Now I grease up the Kickstarter shaft here just so that that seal has some lubrication and I gently slide this on. Now I put one bolt up in the top cover here to act like a dowel guide keeps the cover all the way uh, aligned. I don't do it up. You'll see I stop short. It just helps keep the case cover lined up. And then I just gently wiggle it on until it finally snaps in place. This allows me to go along now and tighten up, or sorry, insert all of the um, bolts that we took out. And I just run these up to the face with my nut driver here. I'm not trying to tighten them up at this point. I just want to make sure that the gasket gets pulled snugly against the case cover. Then I'll follow this up in a cross pattern with my torque wrench going along and making sure that the, the case cover meets the case half squarely. Finally, I have to reinsert that engine bolt. So I push down on the cylinder head and this rocks that back up into place. It takes a bit, it's, it's a little bit of a struggle, but finally it does snap in there. There it goes. And then I just insert the bolt from the other side and tighten down the nut. Finally, I put on the sprocket cover that covers the flywheel as well. And I just tighten these down with a nut driver. There's no gasket or anything on this. It's just a cover plate. And finally, I put the Kickstarter on. I put the Kickstarter on the same, uh, sort of the same way it came off, but I did eventually raise the Kickstarter a little bit so that when you engage it, um, it actually engages in this level. If you, if you try it like this, when you actually step on it, there's not much throw left on the Kickstarter to, to actually start it. So, you, you know, it, it's good for now, but I do adjust it in the future. And then we follow this up with 1.2 liters of engine oil. I think I used a 10W40 here, and I used a motorcycle grade oil for the clutches. Now I'm going to clean up the air filter here. So I just put it in a little jar of soapy water and I do a shaky thing for about 10 minutes. I've never done it like this before, but I thought I'd try it. It actually worked pretty good for this small filter, but it's a lot of shaking, I got to tell you. Once that's done, I just squeeze out the foam filter and, and I rinse it off in some cold water and keep squeezing it like this until all the soap is gone. And then I just sort of hang it up um, on my third hands here for soldering to dry out. So I just kind of clip it in there and put it in the window to dry. Looks pretty good. All right, it's been drying for a while, so I think we can reassemble the air box. First, I'll start by cleaning it. 
And I just use a little bit of brake cleaner here and I clean the in and outside of the box itself. And now that the now that the filter's dry, I can actually take it off and coat it with some air cleaner filter oil here. This is just a sticky, sticky oil that helps trap contaminants as it comes through the filter. And it's just a matter of reassembly. I just slide the airbox back in using that 10 millimeter wrench. I tighten it down. I did forget this one bolt here holds the spark plug high tension lead. So I take it out and I put it back in. I just tighten this down by hand. I snug it down. Finally, we get to putting the carburetor back in. So I take the, uh, the slide out of the bag and I line it up. There's actually an indexing groove on these that slides in. And you have to make sure that that needle valve drops down into the main needle as well. It's a little bit of farkling around here, but you eventually get it. And then you have to compress and tighten down that large aluminum nut. And this takes a bit of time and a bit of practice. I finally get it, but it took me about five minutes to actually get that thing on there without cross-threading it. Now there's a gasket in there that seals that air tight. You want to make sure that you don't cross-thread this or it'll never seal properly. And then I just wiggle it back into the air box boot and I bolt the air intake back down to the actual engine head again. And I snug these down eventually with a 10 millimeter wrench. I don't have a manual for this bike so I'm just kind of tightening this until it feels about right. Now at this point I would normally do a compression test on the engine, but when I pulled out my compression tester I realized I didn't really have the right adapter to fit the spark plug thread pitch that came out of this bike. This is the closest I had. It was a little bit too big. So I'm just going to assume that the compression on the bike is decent. Now the exhaust system is pretty rusty, but it's just surface rust. So I'm going to start by taking off the heat shields here. I use my impact driver um, to knock these screws out. They sometimes rust in here. And an impact wrench like this does a pretty good job of getting these out. Now you can use an actual impact driver like I showed you for the clutch cover. But I didn't want to bend the stinger here or any of these very thin heat shields. So these came apart pretty good. Now the larger part of the exhaust, well, all of the bolts were missing from the heat shield and they had just put it on with a band clamp, which amazes me. The band clamp's probably worth more than the three little screws if you went to the hardware store, but whatever. I'm going to take it over to the grinder here to start with, and I'm just going to use the wire wheel to knock off as much of the major rust as I can. Now the grinder isn't the perfect choice for this because these are fairly intricate, but it gets the major portions done and it allows me to then switch to a handheld wire wheel to get into the small nooks and crannies. The goal here is to get as much of the rust out as possible, and I even hit all the heat shields. Finally, I take them outside and I hang them out on a rack, and I go through and clean all of these with brake cleaner to get any grease or any residue off of them. Finally, I turn to a high temperature paint for the exhaust parts, so the stinger and the muffler or uh, exhaust pipe itself, and I just get the first piece done and start on the second piece and it starts to rain on my head. So quickly I grab the piece, slide it out, and I bring it inside until the rain passes. Finally the rain does pass and I finish up with the high temperature paint here. Now this stuff needs a few heat cycles in order for it to cure properly. And the heat shields, I just paint with glossy uh, metal paint here, glossy black paint, just to make them look nice. I bring them back into the shed, and I tighten them into the vise and let them dry overnight. Oh, a lot of work. The next day, I start by installing the actual exhaust tube itself. So I line it up on the front and I fasten it in the middle 
And I go through and chase and put those eggcorn nuts back on front here. Finally the stinger gets put on and I tighten all the bolts down. Again, I don't have any torque ratings, so I just do this by eye. It took about three cups of coffee to get through this. And at this point, I went to my nuts and bolts section and uh, pulled out three brand new fasteners. Like I said, these are probably about a couple pennies a piece. And this allows me to put the heat shield on in a manner that looks professional again. I think it looks really good. And after this, the exhaust is done. That brings us to the end of this episode, and we got a lot of great things done today. We cleaned the carburetor and the oil filter. We adjusted the valves, and we even cleaned, painted, and remounted the exhaust system. Now next time, we'll turn our attention to the plastics. We'll fix the cracks and dings, clean them up, and get them mounted back on the bike. Until then, I'm Dino. I'm really, really glad you stopped by, and I'll see you soon on Dino's Tinker Shed. Bye now. <laughs>